you've had a few years to think about this. What, in retrospect, what role do you think Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, the Washington Post, his organization, played in the outcome of Watergate? Where, what role did you play? You know, well, he's not the person to answer to that. Okay, you. He played a critical role. Critical role without, uh, I'm not saying it would never have come out, but it sure as hell wouldn't have come out at the time it came out. It, should, it sure as hell wouldn't uh, have gotten uh, CBS interested. No network would have touched that story. No network would have touched that story because there were too many unknowns and they controlled licenses and that. I mean, uh, you know, it, 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 it was terra incognita and terra verboten. Stay the hell out. And uh, so it, it may be, sure, sure, and, you know, who's to say now? It would have yeah, But, the, but, but the, what happened is, and you know, you because of your, uh, what you've done in your Watergate exhibit, you know, is a professional historian, uh, the importance of chronology. Chron you know, if you, you've got to understand this happened before this, before ha happened before that. And I think uh, what, where there was real impact was with two subscribers of the Washington Post. The first was Judge Sirica, who was trying the Watergate burglars. And in his courtroom, uh, they had the Watergate burglars and Howard Hunt and Gordon Liddy, the operational commanders, and they presented, the prosecutors presented the case saying, Gordon Liddy's the mastermind, no higher-ups are involved. And Judge Sirica is reading in the Washington Post quite regularly that higher-ups are involved. And I talked to him many years later about this, and he said when he saw that, he then cranked up his questioning of the burglars, and in fact, he, he threatened 25-year sentences if they didn't start uh, cooperating, and they eventually, McCord broke and you know, wrote his famous letter saying there was perjury and higher-ups were involved. But the impact on Sirica was immense. The second important subscriber to the Washington Post was Senator Sam Irvin, who uh, called Anybody me in. remember Sam Irvin? <laughs> uh, uh, and Irvin called me uh, and said, come see me. This is in January 73 also. I think after the Catherine Graham lunch, and he said, we're going to think about investigating Watergate. We've read, I've read your stories. The implications are incredible. And we have an obligation as a Senate to launch an inquiry. Who are your sources? And I said, you know, we're just, we can't name our sources even to you. And he said, I understand that. But we're going to go ahead and I hope we can get to the bottom of the involvement of the deputy uh, campaign manager, Jeff McRuden, and drew the line there. Of course, they launched that investigation. One of the anomalies is it was voted 77 to 0 by the Senate, many Republicans signing on for this investigation, and it was the gold standard of investigations. They got testimony from everyone. They discovered the tapes, uh, which were crucial to unraveling what really happened in Watergate. So the, the causal connection there, uh, people say, uh, make extravagant claims about the press or the post, uh, bringing down a president. That's just not true. Uh, what happened is, the agencies of government, the Senate, eventually the House of Representatives in an impeachment inquiry. The Justice Department realized they couldn't do this through normal channels. They had to have a special prosecutor. And, and their and attorney eventually. general was about to go to jail. Yes, right. <laughs> who heads the Justice Department. Yes. And uh, there, there were problems, but it was the That's agencies of government that then launched an inquiry into this 
and took the kind of uh, testimony and got the kind of evidence and so forth that established what really happened. Before we go to questions, tell us what you remember of August 9, 1974, the day the President resigned. The, the day that President Nixon resigned. August 1974. Oh, God. I mean, uh, this was one of the longest days of my life. I mean, uh, well, you, 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 if you know what it takes to assemble a paper, probably don't know what it takes to disassemble a paper, which we had to do that night. I mean, uh, we didn't want some rinky-dink feature story on page one with, uh, with all of this uh, news and not absolutely sure what the news was. And uh, it, yeah. uh, we were treading on in a minefield there for a while. But because it wasn't clear whether he was going to resign or not. It yeah. was back and forth. And the night before, August 9th, he did go on television and announce that he was going to resign. Yeah. And but mind you, we had some good sources who's, who were close. Uh, you can say, I'm like Barry Goldwater. Well, that was the, our, our secret source. Nobody thought that Barry Goldwater would have a friend on the Washington Post. <laughs> but uh, he was my wife's mother's, should I say it, boyfriend? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we saw a lot of Barry Goldwater. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Too much information, yeah. man. <laughs> as nice a man as ever drew a breath, incidentally. And uh, was uh, tremendously useful. Source, and he was saying, I think it, that last week he told you, look, Nixon's going to resign, but don't say so in the Washington Post, because that will cause him to stay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we held it a day. Yeah. You know, uh, if, if yeah. that question, it was in the real East Room, where Nixon uh, called together his friends and cabinet and senior staff. And uh, it was a speech without notes. It was Nixon unscripted. And he talked about his mother and his father. It was a very emotional. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it was. Yeah, I'm and, sure. you know, he, he, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's, it's Nixon raw. But there is a moment in that speech which I think uh, is so important to the Nixon presidency and the legacy of Nixon. And that is, at the end, near the end, he waved his hands, the way his arm kind of like, this is where I, why I called you all here. And he said, always remember, others may hate you, but those who hate you don't win unless you hate them. And then you destroy yourself. Now think about the brilliance, no seriously, of that statement. He identified hate as the poison that drove too much of Watergate, too much of the mentality uh, in his White House. And to his credit, at that day, that moment, he's giving up the presidency which he had fought all of his life for. He is detached intellectually enough to realize what had happened, that the hating had, yes, an impact on those he hated and what occurred and investigations and, and so forth, but that it had destroyed him. Um, his uh, assistant at the time, uh, special assistant to the president, uh, Leonard Garner, uh, came to the same conclusion. Um, we'd like to take questions. And uh, Megan and Samaya will come to you. Um, let's uh, let's go. Okay, John. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Where and when did you first meet Mark Kelly? Uh, in the White House when I was uh, in the Navy. One of the jobs Admiral Moore, who I was working for, gave me is to be a courier, take documents over to the White House. Uh, this uh, 
was in my last year in the Navy, 1969, 1970. And I went outside the Situation Room and I was supposed to deliver him to somebody by name. And so I had to wait and there was a guy sitting next to me and it turned out he had to wait about an hour. And as I said in one of the books, it's like we were two passengers seated next to each other on a long plane ride. And so I introduced myself, and he reluctantly introduced himself. Uh, he, had, he was number three in the FBI at that point, I believe. And uh, we had a lot of time to talk, and I was trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I got his phone number and kept in touch with him. And then the accident was uh, first in my reporting career when uh, Arthur Bremer shot George Wallace uh, before Watergate. Mark Feld was an assistant, assisted me on uh, that work that I did. And then when Watergate came, uh, he was right uh, in the catbird suit. I'm going to take a question from the theater. Um, how differently do you think Watergate would have played out with today's instant blog media and 24-7 news coverage? That's interesting. Um, well, I don't think that a newspaper can hold a story as long as the Post did without, without surrendering it to television and to other stories. We really held it from what the, what the, I forgot the dates. The date we ran it was August. Yeah, I mean, we were, we would run drafts of stories and you would ask questions and it would be days or weeks before we would run yeah. stories sometimes. You, of course, could not do that now. <laughs> no, but the, we, we wanted, I mean, it, it was plain to see that we were dealing with something that modestly was earth shaking and uh, the compulsion to be right was, is, is is born into a journalist, and it's it's even more then. But, but I think we would have, uh, if if, uh, if if the uh, if the, if the, if there was another paper or another another yeah the New York Times or the L.A. Times uh, uh, were on the story and and going writing it day after day, uh, it would have moved a lot faster. But if you had the internet and blogs and so forth. A, a lot of young yeah, journalists right. have asked about this and said, well, you just go to the internet and find out. The point is, this information was not on the internet, <laughs> even though it didn't exist. And an equivalent story now, in 2011, would not be on the internet, yeah. that you need human sources, people who are there who are going to say, this what is what it occurred and this is what it means. So the human development uh, it is absolutely critical and people who are journalists now who spend all day at their computer and on those screens uh, are missing something. Well, in, in, in a related question, with newspapers becoming obsolete, I didn't write this uh, <laughs> today, what advice would you give a high school student thinking of pursuing a career in journalism? Uh, go, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I've been asked that. I've had uh, uh, two children who became journalists, uh, uh, and uh, I said, go get a job on a small paper and learn how to write, especially learn how to write a, a declarative sentence so that people can understand you and you can make it clear. And. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that ought to be obvious, shouldn't it? Uh, uh, but, um, and, uh, and when work hard is, is just so essential. I mean, really hard. Uh, I think, I, I, Woodward never stops working. I don't think, I, I, there was a period when I went to the office uh, every day for a year and a half. Sundays, the whole nine yards, just as hard as I could. This is when I was made uh, uh, 
from the assistant managing editor of Post and then the, and I, I just had to I had to be sure I knew uh, not only what was happening but who were the who's the cast of characters and who did you have to work with? I generally say to uh, reporters. First of all, it, it's the best job in the world. If somebody came from Mars and spent a year uh, on this planet, went back and was asked, who had, who are the people who have the best jobs yeah. in America? They'd say, the journalists. Uh, why? Because you get to make momentary entries into people's lives when they're interesting, and then you get out <laughs> when they <laughs> cease to be interesting. <laughs> and all the lawyers and all the doctors you have doctors who may spend days seeing only routine cases. The routine, Bradley hated the routine. He, that's boring. Find out something that we don't know, something that's interesting. So you're always on. You go into the newsroom in the morning, and there's that electricity still yes. of what's hidden, what don't we know, why. Uh, does why did somebody say this or do that? Who's Figure lying? it out. It's Who's lying? lying? Who's lying? A exactly. A lot of people do not tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's take let's take a question from this side of the. Uh, uh, yes, you right there. Hello. You had a question. Do you think a story of the magnitude that you had would be possible in today's newsrooms? Sure, sure, it would be possible in today's newsroom. And again, what's the question? Uh, it, would it be possible in today's newsroom to do a story like this? I think absolutely. And you, we have Ben doesn't care for this point, but I'm going to make it anyway. Uh, the, one of the sayings at the Post was, all good work is done in defiance of management. <laughs> Go ahead, give me the finger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's easy. That's from the heart. That's from the heart. But it doesn't mean you break the rules or you break the law. I mean, go read all the President's Men or see the movie about it. You know, there's Bernstein, a living, walking defiance of management. <laughs> and it is an aggressiveness, it is a curiosity, it is, I mean, Carl taught me, taught Ben, taught so many of us about, you just don't sit by. I remember once there was somebody we wanted to talk to and, and this somebody was getting in a cab, going to New York with a bunch of other people, and Carl just dove through the window into the cab. <laughs> it said, and called me later and said, I'm at the airport, I don't have any money, but I have to go to New York with these people. And, if, you know, if so it, it's not a defiance, it is and you know you're the look. You're the master of this. You let give people a lot of strength. Go out, find out what's going on. You're not going to find out what's going on sitting in your office or going uh, out to lunch occasionally. You can get a, a a whiff of what's going on, but the real hard stuff you're not getting to. So you need to be in that position of. My judgment, our judgment is this is a story. We're going to do this. And then you need editors and owners who say, okay, go to it. We're going to, you know, look, where was the risk in Watergate? Mm -hmm. To Catherine Graham and Bradley. They were established figures. Carl, if this had turned out not to be provable, he could have gone to Rolling <coughs> Stone and been a rock critic. <laughs> I could have done something distasteful like go to law school. <laughs> so we were young kids. We weren't taking, you know, it was a risk on our personal level, but their risk was institutional. And you have to be willing to take institutional risk. If you're not, then you, you know, as you always said about the paper pen, it'll come out. It, it's the daily miracle. <coughs> the daily miracle? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's wonderful. 
What? Got a question? Yes. Um, I often wondered if Watergate would happen today um, would the president resign over it? I mean, it, it seems um, hard to believe that crimes such as that has, have not happened ever since. Have they? And has, have people, you know, would a president today resign over this? Do you know something? <laughs> and the believers in what they call stare decisis because it's already been decided uh, would, I hope, say it's already been decided and let the Pentagon Papers ruling stand. Uh, that's a vital ruling to uh, the democracy in this country. I really think that the biggest problem we have in this country is secret government. And if... Uh, Whoever said it, uh, democracies die in darkness, I think that's true. And uh, if you have a group of people who get the power and say, you know, we, we now have the ball and we can use uh, the government to our political will uh, and no one's watching, there's no accountability system, we're in trouble. Well, one of the, I mean, one of the outcomes of Watergate that you all can benefit from in this library is access to information about your government. And uh, that's one of the legacies. And it should strengthen and gladden the heart of citizens that they know they can get information about their government that perhaps their government would rather them not have. Is investigative journalism today the same caliber as when you worked at the Post? I, I still work at the Post. <laughs> <laughs> I read your books. I, uh, sure, and, and we, we uh, keep hammering at it. Uh, I do spend most of my time doing books. The last book, Obama's Wars, about what there are tens of thousands of words from top secret meetings and uh, discussions in the Oval Office and and private decision moments for the president in that book, and it's not something somebody handed out to me. It's the it's the process of going around. Uh, I some years ago saw uh, all the president's men movie again, and I hadn't seen it for about 25 years, and I realized all the good work, uh, or most of the good work, is done at night. You get the truth at night in lies during the day, more often. <laughs> and, and, and I did four books on Bush, and when I uh, was working on the fourth one, I want to tell quickly this story. There was a general who would not talk to me. And uh, emails, phone calls, intermediaries, radio silence. And uh, I really needed him, so I found out where he lived. And the ideal time to make an unannounced, unscheduled visit for an interview with a general is 8.15. Because they haven't gone to bed, they've, they've eaten dinner, and so I knock on the door, and he <laughs> opens the door. And I'll quote him directly. He said, you, are you still doing this shit? <laughs> Now this is, I, I wanted to kind of say, well, I don't really like your characterization of my work, <laughs> but I just was silent. And he looked at me and literally just kind of 
Come on in. And I left three hours later with the answers to the questions from somebody who supposedly would never talk. You have some, there are some journalism students here. But you, let me just say oh. something about investigative reporting. All, all reporting is investigative. The second question you ask, you're investigating. Somebody tells you, gives you an answer, and if that doesn't satisfy, you dig deeper, dig deeper. So, so uh, I think you ought to under, we all ought to understand, and government servants should learn to expect that uh, all reporting is gonna turn investigative along the line, and it's not the scariest word in the English language. Uh, I, I mean, uh, in, your, in your general conversation, if you're trying to get your child to tell you what the hell he or she's been doing, you're really investigating the, the first version of it. Um, Bob, you're, you're one of the most celebrated interviewers, and you've interviewed most everyone who matters in a number of administrations. What tips would you give uh, aspiring journalists about conducting successful interviews? Well, it, it is, we, we talk about the internet and cable news, the driving forces, impatience and speed, and I'm slow and patient. And I think the key to interviewing people is uh, do your homework, don't just Google them. Uh, find out if somebody, I'm going to interview somebody in the Pentagon or the State Department or the White House and they wrote an article in Foreign Affairs or one of your you know, obscure ac academic journals. Uh, Thank you. I'll get it and read the damn thing. It's always hard. <laughs> And then ask, Too many them about it. Ask, ask them about it in the interview, and they'll think, well, I thought only my mother read that. <laughs> and you, now, it's not a ruse. You have to, the, I, I think the key description is you have to take people as seriously as they take themselves. And people in these jobs take themselves very seriously. In fact, I think most people take themselves seriously. And if you meet them on the terms of I really want to know what you did and what you think, and I'm not in a hurry. I'll stay for three hours or five hours or whatever is necessary. Uh, you can make inroads, and there is something about people in this country, most of them, even we found in Watergate people who had done, uh, committed Ill illegal acts, who kind of believed in the First Amendment and were willing to talk sometimes extensively and sometimes in more limited ways, but there is this community of interest that everyone has of let's know what's going on and who uh, have the, the people who have the leverage of power. Tell them to do their homework too, to find out what the hell, uh, I mean, just don't sit there and ask questions that bounce into your head at the last minute but pursue something and, and, and get them to explain themselves and th then try to get them explain it again. See if their story changes a little and then wonder why. It's, it's really fun. <laughs> Jump in the back. Thank you for coming today, gentlemen. Uh, with nearly 40 years of perspective, how do you view the uh, President Nixon pardon, of, or President Ford's pardon of Mr. Nixon? And uh, as a historian, I see a lot of political figures as gray rather than black and white. What achievements of the Nixon presidency still resonate today? Oh, God. I, I, I hate to answer that question because I don't really know. I think. What, what was right in the thing probably was to, uh, to uh, you know, give him a second, you know, pardon him. Can I tell a story about the pardon? The day uh, Ford went on television about 30 days after he assumed the presidency, went early on a Sunday morning hope, uh, to announce the pardon, hoping no one would notice. <laughs> it was noticed. 
and, uh, but not by me. I was asleep, and Carl Bernstein called me up and woke me up. Now, Carl, who has the ability <coughs> to say what occurred in the fewest words with the most drama, <laughs> said, the son of a bitch pardoned the son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm just quoting. <laughs> and quite honestly, I thought, and Carl thought, and I think, uh, I, and I know Ben thought for a long time that there's something dirty about the pardon, the evidence and an aroma of the deal. Uh, there was a question of justice. Why does Nixon get off? And why uh, do 40 people go to jail and really dozens more have their lives wrecked? And 25 years later, I decided to take the Bradley method and neutral inquiry. What happened? And I, and I did this book called Shadow about the legacy of Watergate in the presidencies Ford through uh, Clinton at the time. And I called Gerald Ford up and asked uh, to talk to him about the pardon, figuring, it, you know, that he'd say, I'm sorry, I've got a golf tournament. Uh, but he said, no, come on. He was in New York that day. And so I interviewed him for hours there. Then in Colorado, where he had a home for hours. In Rancho Mirage in California here, where his, his primary residence was. Had the time, again, and this is the luxury, this is Bradley's gift, time to read all the memoirs, interview everyone who was alive, do a draft of what I thought occurred, go back to everyone, go back to Ford again, go look at the contemporaneous coverage. And uh, simply put, Ford uh, convinced me, frankly. He said, look, I did not pardon Nixon for Nixon or for myself. I pardoned Nixon for the country. We had to move beyond Watergate. Uh, if Nixon was tried, investigated further, tried, indicted, convicted, sent to jail, we'd have two or three more years of Watergate. He said, look at the world I was living in. This is Gerald Ford talking. Cold War, serious problems with the Russians, serious problems with the economy. He said, I had to preempt the process to get Nixon off the front page and out of people's lives into history. And uh, I looked at all of this, examined it, and in Shadow wrote that I thought actually Ford's decision was a very gutsy one. Caroline yeah, Kennedy, the uh, daughter of JFK, your longtime acquaintance and friend, uh, the deceased president, Caroline Kennedy called me up and said, Teddy Kennedy and I read what you wrote in Shadow, and we think that's right. We think, uh, and uh, we're going to give Gerald Ford the Profiles in Courage Award. So there at the Kennedy Library, months later, is Teddy Kennedy, who at, at the time of the pardon in September 1974, had called it almost a criminal act, saying something human beings and politicians hate to say, I was wrong. This was an act of courage in the tradition of a leader going against the grain and realizing what is in the larger na uh, national interest and the high purpose of the office of the president to serve the people and not himself and not the former president, Nixon. And I remember seeing that and it, it's so sobering for somebody in my business to think something is this way, and then you subject it to neutral scrutiny, and it's totally the opposite. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, as editor-in-chief of my school newspaper, and someone who's interested in a career in journalism, have you ever been threatened or feared for your life? And if so, how has it affected you? No, the, 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 have you ever feared for your life? Crossing streets. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, uh, no, that's, that, that's, uh, I, I was, uh, I 
I'll give you a terribly personal. The first time I was uh, on a destroyer and attacked by a bunch of Japanese planes, I was scared to death. And uh, when I didn't uh, embarrass myself never scared after that. I mean, I, I was, I, I, I would say, holy, you know what? Uh, is this going to be costly, or is this going to be hurt me, or what? I, I was never. Uh, yeah, with, with, with that saying that uh, after the Navy, everything's easy. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, if, if you, if, 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 it's quite some true. Some of that stuff. It's is quite true. true. But happily, uh, I mean, we told about how Mark felt kind of warm, um, lives could be in danger. Uh, I think I probably, it was more my paranoia. But no one did try to kill reporters. They do abroad all of the time, and uh, we should uh, thank. What is it, 40 or, 40 or 50 a year? Yeah. Mostly in South Asia now, yeah. in Africa. But it is. It is a giant problem, and it is thank you know thank God not here, and uh, we the the First Amendment operates now. There was a White House scheme when Nixon was president to to try to assassinate Jack Anderson, the columnist that Hunt and Liddy uh, concocted. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was in Colson's crowd. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was Hunt and Liddy, and and you know they. We ran the story. Yeah, I know, but even Nixon yeah. wouldn't have let that yeah. happen. Yeah. We have a, a question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. They couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> how did Watergate change each of you personally? Well, it brought me to this room uh, where I would never have had the pleasure of being. Uh, you know, it put us in a, as a, uh, I don't know how to say this without uh, making myself look like a fool, but it, it made you sort of a minor cele celebrity and uh, real minor man. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Well, you answer it then, and let me answer. No, you. no. I mean, it, you know, it's it's uh, this uh, somebody. Uh, once advised, said, take your work seriously, but not yourself seriously. And I think that there's some truth in that. And, uh, you know, what? when you go through your Watergate exhibit, which we've done a little of and I'm going to do more of today, it's factual, it's this happened, and I've often said this and I've often thought this, but at each point in that chronology, if Richard Nixon had had one strong lawyer or aide who'd gone in and said, Mr. President, knock this crap off. You can't do this. You're President of the United States. You can't think and act like this. It might have stopped. Now, on the other hand, there was so much of it. There was such a mentality. and. Uh, that uh, drove it, that maybe it was unstoppable. And maybe the person who might say that would never be allowed in the Oval Office to, com to communicate that message. But I think always that you, in Watergate, in your chronology, in your exhibit, shows this. You can go in, and if one thing didn't happen, everything after at least in terms of it being disclosed. Disclosure hangs on the most fragile, thinnest of threads, and somebody cut it like that. So I'm, I'm uh, repeatedly uh, find myself withholding judgment, like the Ford case. You think it's one way, it turns out to be the other way. I mean, take the George Bush's Iraq War, a big, giant deal. Uh, how is history, I asked Bush once, how is history going to judge your Iraq war after talking to him for hours about how and why he decided. 
He's standing in the Oval Office and he has his hands in his pockets, you know, thinking I'm finally going to get this SOV out of here. <laughs> and I just asked, how do, you, how do you think history will judge your Iraq war? And he takes his hands out and shrugs and says, history, we won't know, we'll all be dead. <laughs> Comforting thought. <laughs> Bush. 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 Now, he's ducking the question, but we don't know how it's going to look. Well, so. well that, that begs the question. In your work on presidents, have you changed your mind about a president over the course of uh, investigating and writing about that? Well, certainly Ford. I mean, I, well, I went through a real uh, seat change there, and, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it, I think it's much easier, and this uh, just is in my nature, to try to ask questions and find out what happened rather than judge. Um, yes, sir. Uh, I'm curious, uh, in your conversation with President Ford, if he ever imparted to you a feeling or the notion that he knew he lost the election because of his party. Uh, yes, the question <coughs> is about uh, whether Ford knew or, or suspected that he lost to Jimmy Carter in 76 because of the pardon, yes. Uh, but we don't know because there was a pardon. It was, it was part of Jimmy Carter's effort to, you know, he said, talked about the Nixon-Ford administration and so forth, I think quite successfully. But didn't I just read something about the, how American opinion had changed about it and that now there was a, there was a sizable 70% plus majority that approved of it. Of the pardon? Yeah. Yes, I think that's right. And, and it, it, that was not true when it happened. It was much closer. Yeah. No question, please. Hello, my name is Laura Brown Lopez, and I work on the Daily Titan paper at Cal State Fullerton University. I'd like to just say thank you for both of you being here this evening. And my question is, um, what are your thoughts on the media and the government's reaction to Julian Assange and the whole WikiLeaks situation? WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks. Wiki, Wiki leaks. Um, these are the uh, kind Let of. Let us say that neither one of us is the world's leading authority on WikiLeaks, I don't think. Yes, that's right. But now I'm going to pretend I am. <laughs> <laughs> I don't dare. Yeah, and they are. Uh, it's important, but they're mid level classified documents, secret only. And it's what, you know, the ambassador met with the head of state in a country and what the ambassador thinks. Uh, those documents rarely get to the White House and don't have much standing in terms of the decision making by the president where it's incredible in the Obama White House, the Bush White House, how much is controlled by the White House. It's a White House centric operation. So uh, people who made claims that WikiLeaks uh, are the sort of documents that tell you how the big decisions are made in government are exaggerated. That is not the case. But at the same time, it, it, it's useful information. Uh, the initial idea of just the wholesale publication of hundreds of thousands of classified mm. documents without, uh, I mean, you'd never do it. You'd say, read them, vet them. Are we going to tell? Uh, somebody about secret operations and get people killed unnecessarily. And you, you were always uh, emphatic about that. And I think uh, WikiLeaks is kind of being more careful now. But it, I, WikiLeaks probably won't go down in the history books. The Pentagon Papers do and will always. Sir, I have a three-part question. Oh, just one part, okay. please. My question is, what was in the Watergate towers that were after? And did Nixon have a hit list? And how much did the labor unions play a part in that? Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, what were they after when they broke into the Watergate? Two, did the president have a hit list? And three, what role did labor unions play in all of the above? No knowledge of labor unions. 
Uh, I don't have a clue what they were after, what they thought they were going to get. I think it was the testimony of the burglars and others, yeah, as you well know, is they were, it was a general fishing expedition yeah. to get dirt on the enemy. Don't you think that's the best? Uh, yeah. They, the they all testified to different, they all testified to wanting something different. Yeah, yes. but, it, but it generally it was all all dirt. It all comes under the dirt. Yeah, yeah I find something that we can, will give us leverage against Democrats. Imagine the decision to go ahead with that breaking and entering. I don't think that'll ever happen again. I hope not. <laughs> we have to talk. <laughs> Did I uh, ever, su you know, suffer a letdown after Watergate and so forth? Uh, I, I, let me tell you the story about how Howard Simons, who was Ben's uh, deputy. This was uh, after Nixon resigned. It was about lunchtime one day in the newsroom and the, all these, uh, Ben's office and Howard Simon's office had these big glass panes so everyone, I don't know, was that transparency? Of or course. Yeah, so when people could see who was meeting with the bosses. And uh, Howard Simon's uh, just came to his class and said, come on, you know, come on. So I came in and he had an obit page open from the New York Times and he said, see that, that's you. And I said, and I looked at it and it said, John Jones, you know, 72, uh, died, won Pulitzer Prize in 1941. <laughs> <laughs> that's me? He said, yeah, that's you. See that guy? 1941. It's now 1974. Ever hear of anything he did <laughs> since 1941? And uh, I said, uh, he didn't like you. Yeah, no, no. He, I mean, but he, then he said, he said, I think you liked this business. And now get your ass out of here and get back to work. I got to tell one story about Woodward. Tell, go ahead. Which which uh, shows tells you something about him, as, and as, uh, it just tells us something about him. Uh, there was a time when uh, I had both the head of the CIA and the head of the FBI, FBI in my office at the same time. And uh, Woodward could not stand it. <laughs> <laughs> Had not heard about it. Didn't know what the conversation was. So uh, it was not important. But it's so important that I've forgotten it. But anyway, one of my favorite sights in life is to see is to remember Woodward walk. I have a, a, a total glass window on the newsroom. Woodward walk in front of the office this way. <laughs> <laughs> All during the conversation. I, uh, I don't know how many of you remember Robert Penn Warren, uh, but I, I witnessed this. He, he wrote, uh, you know, All the King's Men and uh, and some wonderful poetry afterwards. And I was at a, an event where he was being interviewed and, and this very smart professor named Harold Bloom, who's a great Elizabethan scholar, turned to him and said, Penn Warren, I was convinced that you had reached enjambment 15 years ago and could not write again. What say you, Penn Warren? He said, I'm so happy I didn't know you 15 years ago. <laughs> I think, I think that's sort of the, the response to people that, you know, oh, you did so well at a young age, and so sad that it's all over with now. <laughs> and, and, and there were 11 bestsellers after that for you, and you still write them. Um, another question, right over there. What was your reception of David Frost's interviews of Richard Nixon? 
Remember the Frost interviews of Nixon? Yeah. Yeah, I remember he... Uh, they were pretty good, as I remember them. Yeah, they, they were. If, at one point, uh, Frost asks uh, Nixon about Carl and myself. And, uh, and uh, Nixon says, oh, yeah, they're, uh, they work for the Washington Post, and that's a liberal newspaper, and, you know, politics in Washington, that's the way it is. And, uh, and then he said, what they write is trash, and they are trash. So, put us I, I was sufficiently disturbed to call my mother. <laughs> That's what you do in moments like that. And I said, did you see Nixon? She said, yes. And I said, do you see pretty sharp things he said about Carl Bernstein? And my sister said, uh, yes. And she said, but you know, that's Washington, that's politics. <laughs> And what, one of the things and, uh, Nixon had said was that we work for the Washington Post, a liberal newspaper. I'm sorry, I left that out. And she, so she said, it's Washington, it's politics. What's this about being a liberal? <laughs> um, we have, yes, come on up. Come on, on up, all the way up, yes. Oh, great. Hello. Do you think Nixon was a good president? I think what? Do you think Nixon was a good president? <laughs> uh, I think he was, uh, uh, I mean, it turned out he was a terrible president. But I think after Watergate, I mean, his, his presidency was so scarred by what he did in Watergate that, uh, he couldn't really save or rescue his reputation. But after Watergate, if you could, if you, somehow you could excise that, which you can, uh, I think he, in certainly in, in certain uh, foreign uh, situations, he was okay. Uh, you was know, that's, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, the young man, how old are you? You need a, you have a job in journalism. That's a great <laughs> question. That's a great question. And, uh, you know, this is the judgment uh, question. Uh, what we know uh, factually, uh, particularly from the tapes, I, I mean, there is so much of Nixon on the tapes, and there is the anger, and there is the rage, and there is the regular uh, ordering of illegal and abusive activity, and it's there. You can go hear it. You can go hear it on more tapes. I brought some uh, examples of, we, you don't need to hear more about Nixon's tapes, but the, my problem with what happened during that presidency, and I agree with Ben, some very important accomplishments uh, are included, but what happened in the presidency, and you listen to the tapes, and it's always about Nixon. It's so often using the power of the presidency to settle a score with somebody. Let's screw so-and-so. Let's put them on the tax audit list. Let's put them, uh, let's get the, I mean, they got the Secret Service to bug the telephone. They, Nixon got the Secret Service to bug the telephone of his renegade brother. The Secret Service that's supposed to be a protective agency. And when you, the dog that never barked on the tapes and I have not heard them all or looked at all in a transcript. You don't hear the president or his aide saying, what would be good for the country? What does the country need? What's the next stage of good for a majority of people? The country. And so, in a sense, maybe the tragic part of the Nixon presidency is its smallness, that it did not reach on many levels, that sense of uh, goodwill people feel, whether they're Republicans or Democrats for a president, quite, I've seen it for decades, uh, that there was this, this anger and this insecurity, and as a result, the office 
got diminished because they were talking about so many small things when they should have been talking about larger things. Right. So, Pan Gibbs, could you please speak a little bit about John Dean? John Dean. What about him? Well, <laughs> I didn't hear the question. About John Dean. Yeah, well, if, if Dean uh, was the White House counsel who uh, was the one who blew the whistle on Nixon early and testified uh, in the Irvin Committee and said there were all these yeah. conversations. Well, he does, I mean, no, nobody likes a whistleblower. And uh, he was not, uh, he certainly wasn't very popular in government. And I have no idea. I didn't know him well. I I, I, I got he was know, any and, good at all. And, uh, you know, he, he paid the price, because as you say, he was a whistleblower. He yeah. was the, the snitch. He was a snitch. Uh, it turned out what his testimony said was proof, proven by the tapes, the tapes. With, with, the, with the detail that actually was quite remarkable. And he did not know that there was a taping system. Uh, he is somebody uh, that, the Nixon people hold in the highest disregard. I spoke at the Nixon Center uh, a number of months ago, and they invited me to speak there, and all the old Nixon hands were there and so forth. And Dimitri Sims, who's run, Sims, who runs the uh, center, the old, said the only person we will not invite here is John Dean. Hmm. Question back there, the last question. Hi, Mr. Woodward, you and Carl Bernstein a few years ago sold your personal Watergate archive at the University of Texas for, what, a million dollars? Nice job. Um, <laughs> what kind of stuff is in there that uh, you're waiting for historians to find that will really flesh out the story in an interesting way? Yeah, what's in the Watergate papers at the Ransom Center at the University of Texas is the how we did it, and you can see the trail, and in one interview, somebody says something, and then the next day, one of us is going to somebody else and making phone calls and putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And there, uh, it is a pretty large archive under the terms of our contract with the University of Texas. We retain the files of people who are still alive. And as people die, we send the files down. And later this week, we are going down there to do uh, some symposiums uh, with academics and with Robert Redford, who did the movie, All the President's Men. We're taking a bunch of files of people who passed away. And uh, there's one in particular I, I can't say until later of the, the week. People are going to be really surprised to the extent this person helped us on the second book we did, on the final days. And it will show uh, how people at the very top of the Nixon administration uh, felt disappointed, felt a, a sense of inevitability that because of what went on, uh, he was going to have to leave office. And some people felt this sense of inevitability very early late 72, early 73, uh, you know, more than a year, year and a half before the resignation. So it's, it's a kind of how-to rather than uh, what happened. And then you see people's real language and uh, I exactly how we undertook our inquiry. Ben, any concluding thoughts? Things that Stories, things you well, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not good at it. I, I'm not, I, write, I don't write editorials. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I'm very impressed by all of, that you're all still interested in this. Um, that's a long time ago. Uh, I, I don't think there's another historical, how, how, how long ago is it? 40 years yet? Almost 40 yeah. years. Almost 40 years. Next year will be. And uh, uh, you were all, you show a, 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 a detailed knowledge of it that is really very impressive. And uh, I think that's fabulous. It was an interesting story. It is an interesting story. And it still is. The President of the United
United States getting his, you know what, in a crack like that? And uh, uh, I mean, holy moly. Uh, uh, yeah, Ben, are you? Tell us a little bit of, you've, you've been thinking, and this question came from the, the theater. You've been thinking about Watergate lately, yeah. and you've come up with a, a new formulation to understand. Well, uh, uh, let me make it very quick. The, if, if, if Watergate or the mentality that drove it, which was Nixon and people around him, a series of wars. And the first war was uh, in, in, when Nixon took office, uh, he inherited the Vietnam War. He did not like the anti-Vietnam, uh, the protests and the people who were opposed to the war, and it was a mounting movement. And so he declared war against the anti-war movement, and there was, you know, the usual techniques of following and wiretaps and so forth. And then it turned out the press was uh, in the second war, reporting extensively on the Vietnam War and the anti-Vietnam War movement. And so they tapped the telephone of 17 reporters and White House aides. Then uh, in 1972, the, uh, and what they did is Ellsberg burglary during that period because it was kind of the fury at the press, which is publishing the Pentagon Papers. And in the third war, uh, Nixon's running for re-election, and the apparatus that had done the Ellsberg burglary and a lot of the secret work was just directed at the Democrats because the Democrats were a threat to Nixon staying in office and to the Vietnam War. Then Watergate occurred, and there was the burglary, and there was the fourth war, which was the War on Justice, which is the orchestrated, well-funded cover-up, the denial of what had occurred. And the fifth war was after Nixon left office in 74 for the 20 years of his life. To a certain extent, he conducted a war against history to try to minimize Watergate, to, to say it was a blip, and uh, avoid confronting what is in his own words in you know, dozens of hours of, of tapes. And to a certain extent, the Sixth War uh, was fought here uh, at the Nixon Library, where uh, the question was, how are you going to deal with Watergate? And uh, as a journalist who tries to undertake uh, neutral inquiry. Let's find out what happened. Let's find out what the facts are. I think in that sixth war, uh, Tim, you and the professional historians and archivists have said, we have to deal with the reality. And uh, that sixth war is the Watergate display out there, which tells the history, but it tells it in its complexity. And it's not linear, it's not always clear, and there are lots of people saying, well, but wait, this means that, including Nixon and so forth. But by and large, what, what I, I think history, and I think uh, it's kind of uh, etched permanently there because of the tapes and because of that display in what's here in the library, and people are gonna uh, find things that uh, sicken them, and people are going to find things that uh, they stand up and say because there were moments in Nixon's presidency when he rose to the occasion, particularly in foreign affairs, where he had a vision with China and the Soviet Union, which was uh, historic. And as we go through time, when you're gone, when we're all gone, when all of us are gone, as Bush says, uh, history we won't know will all be dead. <laughs>
happy note, let me thank Ben Bradley and Bob Woodward, who are very much alive. Thank you. Thank you, too, for coming tonight. Thank you very much. Have a safe trip home, and please sign up for our mailing list and come back to the Nixon Library and visit us again. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you both. Thank you so much.